Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and what's next. It's a show that asks questions and peels back the layers of our average everyday experience and goes beyond scratching the surface. We interview people doing incredible things who are making a difference around the globe. Join me as we listen in and get one step closer to understanding that big ideas shared create collaboration. Collaboration can inspire community and communities create social change. I'm David Peck and this is Face to Face. So our next interview today is with Neil Brofman. He's a uh, documentary filmmaker who has made a film called Help Us Find Sunil Tripathi. You're going to enjoy this interview. This is a movie that you need to see. So this is, yes, a filmmaker that we're talking to, a journalist, uh, a film that uh, is going to air on The Passionate Eye uh, in the very near future on CBC. You'll probably be able to access it there. But this is a conversation about movie making I suppose uh, it's about the Boston bombing it's about a young man by the name of Sunil Tripathi but really what this film is about is it's it's about relationships it's about digital decency it's about um, figuring out how to respond to others this is a film about digital media and social media and Twitter and Facebook you're gonna have to listen to this interview to to go a little deeper but I, I challenge you and encourage you to also check out the film help us find Sunil Tripathi uh, this is a conversation with Neil Bromf and I had a great time with Neil I can't wait to do part two uh, and buckle up don't forget to check out our other um, interviews on rabble.ca or davidpecklive.com well, welcome to Face to Face, and we are joined here uh, by another very special guest, a documentary filmmaker uh, by the name of Neil Brofman, and we're going to be talking uh, with him today about his new film called Help Us Find Sunil Tripathi. Uh, Neil, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, David. I really appreciate it. Hey, where, where are you coming from? I'm not going to give away your area code, but where uh, you can give it away for us. Where, where are you? Yeah, I, I, I live in Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia. I'm sorry to hear that, Neil. Well, thanks. It's not that bad. We have nicer winters, nicer winters than you do. I bet you do. Yeah. Right now we are getting dumped on with rain. It's a major, if it had been colder up here in Toronto, we would have been, oh boy, the city would have been shut down. Let me tell you, I think they called for 40 millimeters of rain. So that's some significant, uh, significant waterfall. Um, yeah. The Toronto film scene says, quote, the search may have been for Tripathi, the movie suggests, but it may be we who are lost, close quote. Uh, sorry, that was the Daily Beast. And then the Toronto film scene says a tribute, quote, to the human spirit. What? So so this film's about a lot of things, uh, Neil, and congratulations on it, by the way. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. It's it's important to me, it seems, for a lot of reasons. Can you can you can you lay out a couple of what those might be? Sure. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, 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 the genesis of the film, the, how we got into the film, uh, I was, I met uh, Ita Tripathi, Elisa Gambino, the executive producer, and I met Sandita Tripathi um, on a work trip to East Africa. We do a lot of work in uh, uh, global health, uh, maternal and, and infant health. And on a, so we were in March of 2013, uh, we were working with Sangeeta. She was working for our client. And we met her on this trip, and we worked with her for a couple of weeks. And then when we came back to the States, um, the very next day was the day that her younger brother, Sunil, had gone missing from Brown University. Um, so that's how we got into, we were became acquainted with the family. But what happened in the ensuing six weeks touched on so many different Concern for Elisa and for me and for Heather, who produced the film with us, Heather O'Neill, um, that uh, that in order to fully address these the, the, the issues that are raised, uh, the film is, is is rather complex and works on multiple multiple levels. Right. Um, but I felt like that without without discussing them and delving into these issues, that we would leave things behind that that without um, would leave the story incomplete. And we always figured that, you know, because uh, some people say, well, you should deal with one issue in a film. Um, 
but people are, are pretty savvy, and I think uh, I think they get it. Do you think that? Um, do you think it's your job as a documentarian to answer questions, uh, Neil, or to raise questions? Um, I think that we raise questions. I don't think, uh, at least in, in my film, that uh, we we present what happened and we present the the facts around the story, what happened to Sunil, and then what happened in social media and the things that we'll be talking about soon. Um, but my background is uh, as a journalist for, for many years, and so is Elisa's background and Heather's. And so it's anathema to how we approach a subject to to try to approach it um, with the idea of, well, we are going to answer these questions. We, ha- we were drawn to the subject um, because of, of what happened uh, and how it dovetailed and related uh, in one major aspect to our work as journalists. But um, I, I don't think that we stand on a soapbox in the film and try to tell people what to think. We present what happened and um, we, I think we, we do it in a way that, um, that people can draw their own opinions. So, so you know, it's 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 kind of, it's all you know coming out of Toronto Film Festival and interviewing a lot of uh, directors and actors about their films. It's kind of a weird thing in a way because it's not. I don't typically ask. I hope I, anyway. I hope I don't ask the classic kind of questions. But it, but it, but it is kind of tough when you're 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 talking about something that a lot of people probably haven't seen yet. Um, but but I mean, the story really is about this guy who goes missing, who's accused of being a part of the Boston bombings, and then all of the fallout, essentially the social media-like relational fallout. Is that kind of what you mean about the multi-layered nature of the film? That's, that's right, David. They, they, Sunil went missing from his apartment at Brown University um, in uh, early March, March 16th of, uh, of 2013, and Sunil had been suffering from depression, and uh, his family wanted to find him, so they went to Providence and mounted a very sophisticated and organized search campaign for him using all the tools at their disposal, so social media, mainstream media, local law enforcement, friends uh, who were who lived at Brown, the family, uh, all three of the uh, Tripathi kids went to Brown University, so they have a lot of ties to the school. Uh, the administration at Brown University helped. So they went up there and they put together this very organized campaign um, and basically put Sunil on the radar uh, of social media, and everything was, all the groundwork was laid for what was to happen after the Boston Marathon was bombed. Um, so the, the issues that we're talking about in the film, uh, I felt like we couldn't make this film. It's, the, the, way, the way Sunil was treated in social media after the marathon was bombed uh, demanded that the record be set straight on who was mm. the person that so many people were talking about. So in order to do that, we had to deal with Sunil's depression. In order to talk about what happened, obviously, we talked. Uh, we deal uh, extensively with what, how it um, started trending in social media, and then how it jumped the barrier from social media and unsourced reporting into mainstream media. As mm-hmm. mainstream journalists picked up on this and unsourced, many of them uh, advanced the story through social media, and in a couple of cases uh, in broadcast. And then, as a result of all this, it jumped into law enforcement. So. Um, the story deals with Sunil, but it also deals with how information travels in our society and how we communicate with each other and how the things that we say to each other, how we behave, um, is, is remarkably different from uh, online than it is in face-to-face interaction with people. And, then, and the, the, the repercussions that that sort of communication can have uh, on society in general. So there were lots of things that were happening, and and I and uh, you know like, like I said before, I, I felt like we had to in order to get the story complete. I couldn't we, we couldn't just talk about social media without I felt and we all felt repeating the same things that the other people were doing was 
by basically using Sunil to tell a story about social media. Sunil had been used by social media mm. already. Yeah. And so, um, so this was an opportunity to say, hey, you know, this guy, this is who he was. Um, so that was, that was sort of the, um, why the film but, deals with all these different uh, layers of... Uh, well, and, and what, I think, what I think is fascinating to me about probably, and, and let me ask this question while I sort of unpack it, if you don't mind, but as, mm -hmm. a, as a filmmaker, you probably had a pretty good idea of what you wanted to do. Uh, the you know, like you said, there was a, a demand to set the record straight. So there's this sense of justice probably on your, your side saying, okay, we got to get the facts here. I want to get to the truth. But as you start to make this film, as you start to ask penetrating questions, other things start bubbling to the surface. And, and, and I bet, I would think, I would hope that more of the nuanced layers of the story started to be revealed to you. I mean, as you and I are even just chatting now, I mean, this really is a movie about relationships. Of course it's a movie about Sunil. Of course it's a movie about social media and dissemination of information and about depression and all these things that need to be talked about. But maybe at the core, it's about how we relate to others. That's, that's right. Um, as we started making the film, I, you know, we, you start, I think this is probably very common for, for filmmakers, uh, particularly ones who, who make the documentaries, that you start somewhere and you don't really know where it's going to go. Now, we were working on a story that we weren't working in the, in the style of cinema verite where everything is unfolding as we were there. We were trying to put together a story and tell a story that it had had already happened. Mm, right. But even still, even still, as we were as we were doing our research and uh, you know, talking to different people, the story did. We, we learned a lot of things, and the story turned in different directions. Um, um, you know, things that we uh, just just for instance, there's, there are a lot of voicemails. In the uh, mm. that were left on the family cell phone from journalists, and so you know, sourcing those and and following up on those, and then looking at the social media part of it, and then as different information came out you know, about the police involvement that I, we didn't know about when we started making the film, so you have to follow the the trail where it goes. But as you as you recognize, you pointed out, um, and as I said earlier, the that that one of the major themes that comes, that I think, that I'd like to think is in the film, is this idea of civil society and how how we treat each other. Mm. And being aware of our neighbors and friends and the people that we see. Um, I mean, there's some, some pretty, uh, some, uh, a couple of pretty interesting um, nuggets that came out of our research into the social media part um, that I'd be happy to tell you about too. Well, I think it's fascinating, you know, and for the listeners who haven't seen the film, and I really do urge you to see it, uh, is, I mean, you know, um, I think I think it was, let's see if I can find it, there we go, Pretty Clever Films, who said that, you know, quote, your hands will hesitate before sending that next tweet, close quote. And, I, I, I mean, that's just for me a really simple kind of, you know, not to d d disparage the, the comment, but it's just, it's a simple takeaway. Uh, it, it, I think I think the, the deeper the deeper question I have is what is this actually revealing about who we are as humans? If 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 we have this ability in the first place to 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 Facebook people like this, to tweet about this, to jump to conclusions like this, you know, the the implications of mainstream media picking up on as as you say unsourced reporting, you know, Twitter is becoming truth. And and yeah. you know what you know was is is Orwell just you know watching in on this laughing? <laughs> probably, probably. I don't think he, he would have even imagined it going this far. <laughs> um, you know, we have we, we have uh, in 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 Twitter and in, in the film anyway. You know, pe people who are making statements and accusations that are they're all going by and large by anonymous names well we and neil, neil can real i it was not real let me let me just interrupt neil to, to, to let the li listeners know sure we're talking about tweets and posts that are horrifying we're not just talking about uh, bits of business or information but we're talking about angry venomous stuff being posted on social media so i just wanted to make that footnote very clear sure 
Yeah, that's very, very, very uh, understated. <laughs> I think you know when, yes. when, you, when you see when we see these things. Um, you know, there, for instance, in the in the film, there's there's one one guy who was tweeting pretty actively that night and was saying that really the the most vile, hateful things and threatening things. Um, and in the early stages of the film, and one of the one of the ideas we had thought of trying to pursue was talking to some of these, trying to track some of these people down and find out, you know, hey, what were you, what, what was going on in this moment? Uh, not, not to approach them in an accusatory way or to, but just to find out what were they thinking when they were doing these things. Um, and so we reached out and got in touch with this one guy. This was maybe six months after the events had taken place. And um, um, he sent a note back. We sent a note to him through Twitter and he sent a note back that said, I, I don't want to participate in the film. I hope everything turned out okay for the kid. Mm. Now, 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 this guy had 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 just said terrible, yeah. terrible things, and yet he didn't even know or didn't bother to stick around long enough to find out what happened to this kid that he was that he was disparaging and threatening. Um, and well, I, and that was kind of an open door for me. So I sent a note back and I said, well, actually it didn't really turn out so well. And I told him what happened. Um, and, uh, and he sent a note back, a, a huge, hugely apologetic and trying to explain that when he's on Twitter, uh, he's, he's a different person and, wow. and, um, and he gets caught up in things and it was, it was it was very revealing. It wasn't surprising the, the re, his reasons, um, but uh, and then and then I realized that you know it doesn't really matter what they they had their moment to say the things that they wanted to say, and it, and and they had their moment. Sunil didn't have his moment to explain things because he was a he was a, a very he was an anonymous person, a very quiet person, a member of a loving family. And so, um, so we, we decided that not to go that way because it, it didn't, it, it didn't advance the story in any way. It didn't turn, you know, it didn't shine a light on anything. Uh, we all participate. Many of us participate in social media and ultimately it's up to us to decide whether or not we want to click the button, the retweet button, or to say something or not say something and until we decide as a society how we want to behave, whether it's going to be civilly or uncivilly, um, things will stay the same. Well, I wonder to what degree uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, email, etc., has revealed uh, something that you know has been lurking below the surface for years and years and years, and it usually just came out behind closed doors when you know uh, parents would yell at their kids or brothers would yell at their sisters or whatever the case might be. Now we've got this. This, this global landscape where we can yell at other people that we don't even know and and I guess feel mildly better about ourselves I, I don't I don't I mean maybe we need to have dial in a psychotherapist here uh, Neil <laughs> yeah I mean maybe it's like it's, it's the same maybe there's a similar mentality or motivation behind that is there's to a road rage you know sure in road rage People, people behave to, so there's another human being in the other car, but maybe the car uh, is, is enough to shield the humanity around the, around the people. So, um, and so this is, this is road rage on a completely, completely anonymous and unaccountable level. Um, I mean, of course, we've seen stories where people have, uh, have bullied, uh, you know, a lot of bullying online and, and those people are held accountable and they have been. Um, but by and large, it's ultimately out there to, you know, people are free to do what they want. And uh, well, maybe, uh, uh, I don't know what it says about our nature. Is it, is it, is it that we still, because the internet is so new, you know, is it, is it, we still haven't written the rules around digital decency? Is that, is that what we're missing here? I, I don't know. I mean, that, it, it, it could be that, but if we look at, if we look at, pre-internet and pre-social media that we still had road rage we still had we still have uh, riots and when people are in large groups and they get together and they're with like-minded people then uh, their behavior which may be extreme to people who are not in that group perhaps um, 
uh, is doesn't doesn't seem so ex- you know extreme to them, and it becomes normal. So it's very possible that in this moment, people who are writing these things and get involved with these trending, uh, like what happened with Sunil, uh, they didn't see anything wrong with it at all. Uh, it was it was just we're in a large group of people and we're trying to we're trying to solve the Boston Marathon bombing, and 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 this is and we're talking about it. So, so I mean, Neil, haven't you written, haven't you come home from a conversation, I don't know, over a coffee or a phone call where, or, or you've received an email that you completely impose your own sort of, I don't know, brokenness on, let's say, and then, mm-hmm. and then you respond uh, in by email and then don't hit send and you say, you know what? I think I'm going to get Elizabeth to read this before I send this. And I think as I get older, I'm getting better at not hitting send, if you know what I mean. Like, I, do, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. you know, in the heat of the moment, you get upset, you get a little pissed off, you're angry, your, 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 your ego's out of check, you, 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 you read between the lines way too much, and you put tone of voice in, into a digital piece of communication that's probably not even mm-hmm. there in the first place and you overreact and I remember I remember I remember standing over the shoulder of a friend of mine and I'm saying man please don't send that email that's that's not going to yeah. do you any good bam he hit send and <laughs> you know we lose some perspective in front of the screen or something yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah you know I, I you're, you're, you're right that's a, that's a good point I would add say though that that when perhaps one of the reasons you know it's it's clearly a better idea to cool cool down you know give yourself a cooling off period before before we send something but you know if you had sent something or your friends who sent who sent his email it it has your name on it and you are sending it to somebody that you have had an interaction with and there's no no hiding from that right but if you're reading a if you're reading a newspaper article, uh, or you're sitting in a chat room on uh, uh, in a, on a subreddit in Reddit, or following things that are trending on Twitter, you can send things out. There's no reason. There's nothing staying your hand from sending that tweet right. or writing that comment because right. nobody knows who you are. It's, it's, right. it's liberating. The, the, I think what's cause for concern is what is it liberating? Right. In, inside of each of us so um you know it's uh, i think we have to we again we have to look and, and decide is this is this how we want to is this how we would talk to somebody that we were sitting face to face yeah there's a certain anonymity that's for sure and yet we leave this digital footprint that is uh, so sort of uh, that 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 can be traced so uh, anonymous on one hand and yet loud and clear on the other Yes, well, there are people in the film who were not anonymous. Um, Sunil's, uh, there was a, a young woman in the, who was tweeting that night, um, and um, she went to high school with Sunil, and she was saying things. She's, she was one of the fulcrum points, actually, of, uh, of what tipped everything off that evening. Uh, she went by her, you know, she was out there on her own. Right, um, yeah. As, as, were, as were some of the journalists, and that was... That was one one of the things which is uh, concerning um, was that the journalists are also doing this, and they're by by putting their name on a piece of information, they are also stamping that information with uh, a you know, good housekeeping seal of approval that this is this, you can trust me because I'm a journalist, um, and I think that what we saw happening uh, the night that all of the things were happening on social media takes that whole idea of trust and um, and tears and tears at the central fabric of it. Well, and again, we're we're back to sort of the multi-layered, nuanced nature of the film. I mean, now now we're just talking about about, about truth, really, in a sense, aren't we? Yes. Yeah. Um, what is what is truth, and how do we how can we identify it? But you know what you said before about words on a screen. Something something happens when people read something on a screen that seems to be written with some authority. You know, I the, the FBI says this, or the Boston police scanner said that. Um, 
you know, when some statement that seems factual, what what troubles me is that so often there's no questioning involved. It's oh, did you hear that? And before you know it, they've shared it with people, with their friends. I mean, we see this on Facebook all the time. Someone puts something up there which is com- completely, it, it, it's not true and easily debunked. Yet still, they believe it and they put it up on Facebook. Hey, did you see Facebook's going to own your, your entire universe of, of information? And you post this on your Facebook page uh, by next week. And of course, you know, these things are they're, they're, they're clearly not true and they're easily found out to be not true. Um, yet still, it's, they read it and um, it must be true. I wonder, I you know. Writing. As, as you were saying that, Neil, I just, I thought of, you know, our own, you know, and as a documentarian, a filmmaker, a journalist, you, you must be able to appreciate the, you know, just our gift for the gab, our ability to take a story and to exaggerate it, you know, what actually happened, what we tell at the dinner party later that night. And, and I wonder, you know, is it, is this, is this about vanity? At the end of the day, you know, about having people reading our tweets, about posting our pictures on Facebook and so on. I'm not saying that it is necessarily, but I wonder. And I think I think there's something in your film. I found I found the security camera sequence to be heartbreaking, by the way. Um, uh, It really, really is uh, of where they actually kind of find Sunil again for a brief period of time. And and I think it was his sister. Was it his sister, Sangeeta, who talked about about the loneliness and the... the, Mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, it was, here's the quote, it was too lonely, it was too dark and too cold uh, for for Sunil. And for some reason, he spiraled into this depression, which, you know, we can't, you don't really get into in the film. but, but But I wonder to what degree this kind of behavior, at the risk of sounding really dark, but this kind of irresponsibility towards others, you know, relationally and digitally could lead to the very kind of depression that Sunil suffered from. Does that make any sense at all? Mm-hmm. Sure, it does. It does make sense. I, I suppose if, if, uh, if someone is looking for, I mean, look, let, let's start off that you know, d- depression is a, is a mental illness. Um, it's not necessarily that, but there are certainly things in the world that can exacerbate the symptoms. And so, um, you know, if someone is, is relying on things that they read and communicating with people online to, to find solace or help or, or perhaps the way they view the world or the way they thought the world is turns out to be the way the world isn't. Right. Um, you know, and and that, that, uh, that these things can, Shake people to their to their core, you know, and 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 have a have a big effect on them. And I think in Sunil's case, anyway, and, and that footage, that that uh, that security camera footage is 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 it is it's heartbreaking. It's um it's very difficult, to watch. and uh, and so you know the the just the idea of of the fragility of people and and how these outside forces can, can possibly affect uh, what they're going through. Is, um, I think that comes through a little bit in the film. You know, we, uh, we talk about it a little bit. You know, it's, I, we're probably going probably gonna to have to wrap up the conversation fairly soon here, Neil, and I hope you'll be uh, open to doing a part two. I think you've, you've got a few showings coming up. Is that right? A couple of festivals that you're heading to in the near future? Yes, sir. Yes, well, we uh, the, the film had its um, in, its its world premiere here in Atlanta last spring, and then we went to Toronto for Hot Doc, which yes. is our international premiere, and um, and we were also part of Docs for Schools, uh, which is an amazing program that Hot Doc has, and uh, we were able to screen the film there for 650 high school kids from around nice. Ontario, uh, which was an uh, just an amazing an amazing experience. Yeah, I, um, I, I bet it was. And since then. Yes. Uh, since then, uh, we've been in a number of festivals in uh, Brooklyn, Albuquerque, um, um, New Orleans. We have Denver coming. St. Louis. Um, uh, we are we are uh, in the Colchester Film Festival in the UK a couple of weeks ago in South Korea, um, and so the film has has gained some traction, and we're 
we uh, we have a distributor, and um, uh, through our distributor, we were uh, it's now on. Uh, it was broadcast on the Passionate Eye on the CBC, um, and uh, it's going to have a second screening um, this weekend. Uh, and um, and then we have, uh, as I said, St. Louis Death and a couple of other festivals coming yeah, up. That's great. But we're starting. We are starting to get the film out, and uh, and the response we've had has been has been incredibly moving and uh, great. Amazing. Yeah, it's the kind of, you know, it's the kind of film, I mean, I, I think film, period, has the ability to change the world. I really do. I know that's a lofty claim, but I think it has the ability to, at least, if nothing else, plant seeds uh, for change and things that will be watered by the arts and will be watered by relationships and education and stuff along the way that will someday people will maybe reflect back on and go, aha, maybe that's where this came from and i think that's what's so wonderful about this kind of storytelling so again thanks for the film but but just listen just before we wrap up you know there's okay. something there's and i want to read a quote here just try found on a blog a couple of days ago but there's something very um moving about um Sunil's brother and sister, Sangeeta and Ravi, uh, at the end of the film, there's something very compassionate about their response to, uh, you know, this misunderstanding, this, this, this attack, um, where they should be so angry, you would think, where they should be so upset. And I'm sure they've gone through a mixture of emotions over what's mm-hmm. occurred. But, there, but still, I mean, did, did you have to really draw that out? Or was that, was that really something that was just was there throughout? Well, that's, that's, that's absolutely who they are. Yeah. Uh, they, they are a, a remarkable family. Um, they, get, they, they put so much trust in us to tell this story, um, and and I and I have to add as a journalist that um, we as the filmmakers had complete editorial control. So it, wow. it's not like it's not like we sat down and, and worked with them to make the film. But they're clearly part of the film. It's about them, and we showed them the film before we showed it to anybody. Uh, uh, but um, that is who they are, and. You know, they they had a, a long experience of six weeks looking for Sunil and using social media. Social media, for, for much of the time they were in Providence looking, was very good to them. It was their best friend. And, and then it got really dark. Um, and then it got uh, it got better. Mm-hmm. And so and then if you if you take that and put that together with the uh, the much, much bigger thing that happened in their lives with Sunil, um, I think that they, they genuinely, I know, they, they genuinely felt carried by social media in a way, and they pack that the negative and what happened. They, they put that away um, because their, their whole um, viewpoint on life is that we have to reach out to other people and we have to help other people because they've been through uh, this to the extreme in what in in their relationship with Sunil, and then in what happened in the uh, you know the days after the Boston Marathon bombing. Well, it's it's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful way to sort of wrap up the film. It seems to me, you know, this idea of. Here's here's how not to be human. <laughs> we we've we've yeah. just we've just watched how not to be human. Here, here's here is a, a compassionate, uh, comprehensive, holistic, loving kind of response about treating others the way. Uh, I mean, it goes beyond how we want to be treated, doesn't it? I think it's it's it's. Uh, for me, it, it it makes me want to hope. I have a seven and ten year old. I, I, I watched this family and I think there is hope. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really glad to hear you say that because many, many people who've seen the film, um, you know, so, some people look at it and they, and they say, you know, the things around the, the I guess, I'm not going to say the negative side, but the dark side of the film. But I've had quite a number of people say that they felt uplifted in a way yeah. and hopeful. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, I think like when you said, when you, when we see the family at the end, after all is said and done, what do they have left? Well, they have each other. And, uh, and I think that that gives it that, that, that feeling. Um, it certainly wasn't one that was by design, but I think them 
their presence and their honesty and trust comes through uh, powerfully. I mean, we were, Elisa, Heather, and I were, uh, and Patrick, who cursed, who wrote the, the, the beautiful music for the film, were all just absolutely floored. My bad. By the uh, by, the enormous responsibility that they that we had, and um, and and in the way the family was so 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 um, graceful and eloquent. And uh, well, in their th- Neil, there's just there, there's just such a sense of um, I don't know what it is spiritual tenacity and 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 uh, relational wisdom and emotional intelligence. I mean, you know, the list is pretty long, and I think. Uh, that the the way the Tripathi family has dealt with this, and ple- you know, I'm not trying to undervalue uh, the the level of mm-hmm. of sadness uh, uh, that they mm-hmm. must feel, and and so on at the at, at how all th- all these things have pan- uh, panned out. But I, it, they're a model, honestly, at the risk of sounding kind of corny. It, it they really are a model for for all of us. It seems to me, from right. from yeah. uh, you know, to our friends, to our kids, to our parents, to 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 the people we meet on the street. You know. Yeah, I, I, I'll tell you. If there's time, I'll tell you the, a very yeah. quick. Answer. Yeah, go, go. After after the uh, at Docs for Schools, um, as I said, we were at the Bloor Cinema, and uh, so I think there were 600, 600 was packed. Yeah, it's great and, space. Uh, it, it was fabulous. Um, I mean, it was just the that whole the whole hot dogs experience was uh, was just amazing. It was just really amazing. Um, but after the screening, you could have during the film, you could have heard a pin drop. I mean, this is you know heavy subject matter, very serious, and these are all kids who are, but you know ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth graders. Uh, and um, when the film was over, Judy, uh, Judy Trapassi had come to Toronto with us uh, for the for the screenings at Hot Docs, so she was there. And this was the first time she'd ever watched it uh, with an audience, hmm. and it was the all oh, these these young people, and they just wanted to talk to her and talk to her and talk to her after yeah, the screening the Q and A. But then when it was when all that was over, there must have been thirty five or forty kids in a single file line. Wow. Waiting, waiting to hug her. And they were all <laughs> all throwing their arms around her. They're all you know, there's a lot of tears and a lot of hugging. And Elisa and Patrick and I were watching this and it was extremely moving to see. I mean there wasn't a dry eye in the house watching this. But when the kids left, Judy told us that all the kids, they were hugging her, they were whispering in her ear, and they were telling her about their troubles and their, their battles with sadness and mm. things that happened in their families with a mother or an uncle or someone, you know, someone who had suffered from depression. And it almost is like the film allowed to be a safe space to have these sorts of discussions about a topic which is often stigmatized, yeah. and um, and I think that for for the Trapathi family anyway, that sort of moment is is uh, of extreme value to be able to create this space where kids and young people and, and people can talk about it. I mean, we've had lots of screenings where th- this this topic, you know, afterwards becomes a some. It's very open. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, that was an unintended consequence of the film. Well, I we, didn't realize it would have that kind of effect, but it, it, it certainly does. It's very powerful. Well, congratulations on on the hot docs and and all the success with the film, and and also just I want to honor the fact that you guys have uh, opened up uh, another pathway to a conversation that needs to continue uh, on a variety of levels, uh, and and it really. At the end of the day, it seems to me it comes down to, uh, you know, how we how we treat others. Um, I'm going to quote here uh, from a blog uh, that is called "Let Movie M- Movies Move Us." Uh, never heard mm-hmm. of it before, but quote: "Help us find Sunil Tripathi is a terrific documentary film, and the way it was made, it perfectly connects all the dots, making this film an entry in the short list of documentary films that must be seen by everyone who still believe." that there is something good out there, close quote. And I, I think it's a really nice way to wrap up our conversation. Neil, thank you so much uh, for taking the time and for your generosity 
Um, I really appreciate uh, you being with us today. The film is Help Us Find Sunil Tripathi. Uh, it, uh, it, Neil, is it going to be on, is it Netflix? Is it DVD? Is it download? What's, what's next? Uh, we are actually in uh, figuring that out now. Um, there's, uh, uh, so I don't know. We okay. have some, we, we've been, you know, as I said, the CBC has it. Um, we have, there are a couple of international broadcasters that have it. And we're looking at what we're going to do in North America and, uh, and how we'll get it out there. But it will be available at some point. Um, and uh, I, I hope that uh, people can, can find it and watch it. It'll be on the Passion and I website um, Excellent. for the next couple of weeks. Very good. And, we'll, and I'll, certainly, uh, I'll certainly get that information up on the site as well. Help us find Sunil Tripathi, director Neil Brofman, here with us today on Face to Face. Thanks, Neil, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you, David. It was, it was great. Thank you. I appreciate it, too.